Hello students, welcome to another video lecture for ComSci 125 Operating Systems. In this chapter, we're going to talk about multiprocessor scheduling. But before we proceed to that topic, let us have a short review of what we discussed last time. So, in the previous video, we talked about proportional share scheduling or fair share scheduling, wherein we discussed three approaches. The first one being the lottery scheduling, the second one, the stride scheduling, and the third one, which is used in Linux, is the uh, completely fair scheduler or CFS in Linux. Now, the lottery scheduling uses random numbers, and the strategy scheduling uses a deterministic approach, and uh, the CFS uh, is actually the real scheduler that is used in Linux. And we also discuss the different issues associated with fair share scheduling. One example would be, one issue would be that most I.O. bound processes will, uh, will not get fair share of their CPU time. Nonetheless, uh, in this chapter, we're going to look at multiprocessor scheduling. The previous topics on scheduling focused on our system having a single CPU only. Things will get more complicated if we have multiple CPUs or multiple processors. So let's get started with this chapter's topic. Multiprocessor scheduling. What do we mean by multiprocessors? Traditionally, most computers usually have a single processor only a single chip that contains the single processor. Now with the rise of, when we say multiprocessor, this is one, proce one processor and let's say this is another processor. So processor one and processor two, they are both separate chips that contains the central processing unit or, or the processor itself. Now with the advancement in computer architecture and hardware, they introduce what they call multi-cores. When we say multi-cores, you have one chip here, but you can have multiple processing cores. So you have the chip here, and then you have the actual processors inside a single chip. So this uh, is, a, in a way, a mechanism to package the processors. And thus, there is now the rise of uh, multiprocessor scheduling, or sometimes multi-core scheduling. Now, there will be complications when we have multiple processors. A common misconception about multiprocessors is that if you add more cores, it will make your applications run faster. This is not usually true because in order to take advantage of multiple cores, the applications should be written to take advantage of these multiple cores via parallel processing using threads or other mechanisms. So please take note of that, that buying a multi-core processor does not necessarily mean that the applications with performance will improve unless the application was written 
in a parallel manner. The question that we'll analyze now is how do we schedule jobs or processes on multiple cores? But before we discuss the actual scheduling algorithms, let's have a short review or an overview of computer architecture. In this slide, we have a single CPU with a cache. Remember that the CPU is responsible for the actual computations, so it has the components ALU and then it also has a control unit and inside uh, the CPU there are storage fast storage devices called registers usually the computation will involve the use of registers and data from the main memory now most CPUs have a cache component. This is another storage that is fast but slow, uh, slower compared to registers. And the purpose of the cache is to store data so that less time will be spent from fetching the data from the main memory. So the cache is a small, fast memories, but as I said, it is slower compared to the registers because the CPU has direct access to the registers. It hold, uh, the cache holds uh, copies of popular data that is found. When you say popular data, that means this is the data that is frequently accessed or frequently used. Now, the main memory is separate from the CPU. So there is a bus that connects the CPU to the memory. And the main memory is the one that holds all the data and access to the main memory is slower than the cache. In computer architecture or in OSS, usually we have a triangle of the storage hierarchy. So the registers will be this. These are small storage devices but fast. Then cache will be here at the second level. There are different kinds of caches, two kinds, two main kinds. We have the instruction cache and the uh, data cache. And then the lowest layer, we have the main memory. It has a larger capacity, but it is slower. So if you look at my virtual machine here, So you can see the specification of my machine here. It has two cores per socket. So that's why this is uh, shown here. And then there is one hardware thread per core. And let's take a look at these caches. So it has three level caches. We have L1D and L1I. D is for data, I is for instruction, and this is the capacity of the L1 cache. Then in addition to the L1 cache, we also have an L2 cache, which is slightly larger in capacity, which is in this case 512 kilobytes. And the L3 cache is larger 
which is 12 megabytes. So if we're going to draw that, the this cache here is still divided into L1, L2, and L3. By keeping the data in the cache, the system can make uh, the slow main memory access appear to be fast one. We'll see this in the succeeding slides. Now given the architecture of our CPU having caches, one issue that can arise is the issue on cache coherence. So remember that the purpose of the cache is to speed up access to commonly used data. Uh, I forgot to mention or to discuss what we mean by temporal and special, spatial uh, locality. In computer architecture, we have the idea of locality. Locality is the nearness. Right? So when we say temporal locality, that means the data elements that we're going to use will be accessed frequently. So that's called temporal locality. And then spatial locality on the other hand means that the data that we're going to access usually are those data that are near each other. So this th this characteristic of processes or the execution of programs are taken advantage of by the cache. Uh, it is important to know that this understanding was uh, observed by analyzing several processes. For example, when you sort a list of numbers, there is spatial locality because if you have an array of numbers, then most probably the memory addresses that you're going the, that the process a sorting program or a sorting process will access will be those that are ne near each other. So it's better if we place them in the cache so that we don't need to go to the memory every time we need to access these numbers. So let's go back to the issue on cache coherence. To illustrate this, let's say we have two cores. So we have CPU 0 and CPU 1. Then uh, they have their own caches. And then this is the main memory. So they share the same memory and they share a bus. Then at time two, CPU zero or a process uh, instructed or there's an instruction we're in running on CPU zero that reads a data at address one. So remember that the memory is uh, has addresses. So let's say there is uh, a desire or a need to access the data on this memory location. So since this data is not in the cache, it will be fetched from the main memory and then it will be stored in the cache. So that's what happens at time one. Then at time two, the process that access memory one, uh, memory address one, and obtain the data D, it updated the data to D prime. 
So this is now the new value after CPU 0 or the process updated D. This is the this is what is contained in the cache, but what is contained in the memory is not yet updated. Probably because of delayed write, because there are certain uh, protocols on when the cache should update the main memory. But in this case, at time 2, the data in the cache is D prime while the data in the main memory is D. Then at time 3, CPU1 rereads the value at address uh, this actually that address A, it should be at address 1. So it rereads the value at address 1. And it gets its own copy since what is in the main memory is D. The copy that will be stored in its cache will be D. And there is now an inconsistency. CPU1 is using the old value D, whereas CPU0 is using the updated value D prime. And that is what we mean by uh, cache coherence, this issue on cache coherence. So this will be considered also when doing multiprocessor scheduling. How then do we solve this cache coherence problem? One solution is via bus snooping. So remember that the two processors or the two cores, they have a shared bus. So in bus snooping, each cache, cache pays attention to memory updates by observing the bus. When a CPU sees an update for a data item it holds in its cache, it will notice the change and either invalidate its copy or update it. So for example, by a bus snooping, when CPU uh, at time 2 here, when CPU 0 updated D to D prime via bus snooping, CPU 1 will be alerted that uh, D has been updated to D prime. So later, when it fetches the value d d here from the main memory it will know that this d has been updated by the other cpu and should be d prime already so that's one way updating it because of the snooping that it did the second issue when it comes to multiprocessor pro, uh, scheduling is synchronization. When accessing shared data across CPUs, mutual exclusion primitives should likely be used to guarantee correctness. If you have multiple CPUs, then most likely you'll have two execution threads and if these threads will access a shared data structure, let's say a linked list, there is a critical section problem. We will discuss this later in the succeeding chapters and there should be a mechanism to use certain primitives to guarantee the correctness of this ex of the execution otherwise it will mess up the data structure let's have an example here so here we have a node 
definition with two fields int value and pointer to the next node then we have an operation list underscore pop if you recall your discussion in comsci 123 this operation will remove the first element in the list and then return the value on that uh, first element the implementation will look like this first we create a temporary node and point that to the head of the list and then we extract the value because we're going to return this and then we move to the next of the head to indicate that uh, we're going to remove the head and then finally return the value now what if two processes are executing this piece of code so there surely will be some problem so let's say we uh, to illustrate this further so we have a head here and there are two processes that are accessing this list right so at one point these processes may be at the different stages of their execution because remember the context switching okay so at one process might be at this point in the code another process might be in this point of the code already due to context switching so if there is no uh, use of mutual exclusion primitives chaos will happen and most probably this shared data structure will be corrupted a typical solution is by the use of locks so what will happen is when a process is doing is calling the pop function it will try to obtain a lock so that it will have exclusive access to the data structure and no other processes will be able to perform these operations unless they have the locks once this process is granted access it can perform all these operations without being preempted preempted and then after the completion it can call an unlock operation so that other processes can execute this piece of code so this way it is guaranteed that only one process will be accessing this shared data structure and thus it will not mess up the system The third issue that needs to be addressed is cache affinity. As much as possible, we keep a process on the same CPU. Why? Because a process builds up a fair bit of state in the cache of the CPU. Going back to our figure, if a process is running in CPU 0, then most of the data that that particular process will need are most likely stored in the cache of that CPU. So the next time the process run, it will run faster if some of its state is already present in the cache of the CPU. So that's the main idea of cache affinity. A multiprocessor scheduler should consider cache affinity when making its scheduling decision. 
Now let's move on to the actual scheduling approaches. One approach is to have a single queue and we will call this approach the single queue multiprocessor scheduling. This means that we only have a single queue of ready to run processes. Then each CPU will simply pick the next job or process from the globally shared queue. The advantage of this it is simple. However, there are some disadvantages. The first one is the lack of scalability. Some form of locking needs to be inserted because this, this will be a shared data structure. So the more the processors that are competing to get the lock, then the performance will be affected. So as you add more processors or cores, several processors will compete to get a lock on the shared uh, queue and that will be a problem. Another one is a uh, cache affinity issue. So let's have an example. So this will be the ready queue. We have five processes A, B, C, D, and E. And then we have four CPU cores, CPU 0, CPU 1, CPU 2, and CPU 3. As we schedule these processes, so we can assign A to CPU 0, B to CPU 1, C to CPU 2, D to CPU 3, and then E to CPU 0. So you will notice that process A will be migrating from one core to another and that will affect the cache affinity because whatever state it has stored on the cache on CPU 0 will be useless because a will now move on to a different CPU. So the cache is useless. Now how do we solve that problem? One solution is to preserve the affinity for most processes. So the idea is to simply ensure that majority of the processes will remain on the CPU where they were initially scheduled. In these examples, jobs A through D or process A to D are not moved across processors. So A, B, C, D, as much as possible, uh, they remain on the initial processors where they were assigned or scheduled and only job E would be migrating from CPU to CPU. So this E here migrated from one. Since majority of the processes did not move from one processor to another, then cache affinity is somewhat solved. However, Implementing such a scheme can be complex because, again, we have to maintain additional state. The second approach is the multi-queue multiprocessor scheduling. So the variation is sim to simply have multiple queues and for each CPU core, we have a separate ready queue or run queue. Each queue will follow a particular scheduling discipline. When a process enters the system, it is placed on exactly one scheduling queue and it avoids the problem of information sharing and 
synchronization. So let's have an illustration of this. So let's say we have uh, two processors, two cores, CPU 0 and CPU 1. And then for each CPU core, we'll have a dedicated ready queue or run queue. So for CPU 0, we have Q0. For CPU 1, we have Q1. And if we use the round robin scheduling policy for CPU 0, this is how the schedule would look like. AACC, AACC, AACC. And for CP1, BBDD, BBDD, BBDD. So notice that the processes that are scheduled on the CPU came from the ready, their ready queue only. So MQMS provides more scalability and cache affinity, unlike in the uh, single cube approach, right? So we are in you have uh, a single global ready queue. Now, a problem will arise here and in MQMS. What will happen is that after C in Q0 finishes, there will be an imbalance because A will get twice as much CPU as B and D. So, given these two Qs, for example, and then C has finished, then CPU A, uh, CPU 0 will only run process A, whereas CPU 1 will have to schedule processes B and D. And after, let's say, A finishes, then Q0 will have no task, will have no processes in its queue and it's basically idle. So as you can see, we have uh, this schedule and CPU zero is doing nothing. If we, if we can move, let's say D to CPU zero, then it will actually be more, um, it will actually be more balanced because both CPU 0 and CPU, CPU 1 are BC. So how do we deal with the load imbalance? So the solution is migration, process migration. We allow one process to move from one ready or run queue to another queue. For example, Q0 is currently empty and Q1 has two processes B and D in its queue. This is, this is the queue for CPU1. What the scheduler will do is to move either B or D to CPU0 so that the load will be balanced. There is one process waiting to be scheduled on CPU 0 and there is one process waiting to be scheduled on CPU 1. A more tricky case would be a single process migration is that single process migration may not solve the problem because what will happen is that if you only migrate one process over time the previous scenario will uh, arise again or will come up again. So a possible approach would be to keep switching processes continuously. 
so you do not perform just one migration so you do the migration continuously this is an example of that so we have two cores again cpu 0 and cpu 1 and then a is scheduled on cpu 0 and b scheduled on cpu 1 then at this point b will be moved to cpu 0 and then at this point a will be moved to uh, cpu 1 so the migration happens continuously not just in a single instance most real operating systems implement this as we will see in the demonstration later how do we determine when to move when to migrate one process from one queue to another we have the concept of work stealing we're in to be able to move processes between queues a source queue that is slow on processes is picked and then this source queue will uh, try to check or pick at other target queues and then if the target queue is more full this means that there are more processes on that queue the source will steal one or more processes from the target queue so this, this is normally done but the main disadvantage is that it has high overhead because from time to time you have to do the picking and checking of the other queues and scaling which means that the more processors that we have the more queues that we have the more queues that we'll have to check so linux has is actually uh, actually supports multiprocessor scheduling so we have the original O of 1 scheduler with a priority based scheduler uses multiple queues change the process priority over time uh, schedule those with the highest priority and interactivity is a particular focus now cfs this is what we discussed in the previous chapter is deterministic proportional share approach and it uses multiple queues then we have the bf scheduler this is a single queue approach also proportional share and based on earliest eligible virtual deadline now let's take a look at the linux system and see how it schedules processes So the first thing that uh, we need to do is to run some processes. So let's uh, go to the Let's run the so if you run this CPU program, okay. So 
we are interested in knowing where uh, first let's look at the sked debug which we discussed in the previous chapter and let's see what information we can get so this is the sked debug so what are the information that we can derive so as you can see in the setup we have this label here uh, cpu zero okay. and these are the properties and then notice the cfs run queue okay. this is the first okay, first run queue and this is also another the same queue but with the different uh, process running okay. uh, so there are several uh, queues okay, so basically this is part of system d and uh, we have the real-time queue we have the dl and these are the runnable task for the run queue or the ready queue for CPU zero. So you will notice that there are a lot of processes here in this queue. Right? And this is the process that we are looking at. Okay. And then we also have here another CPU, which is CPU number one, and almost the same information containing all the processes, runnable processes, waiting to be scheduled on the on this particular CPU. So I mentioned earlier that in Linux the CFS scheduler, if you have multiple cores or multiple processors, it maintains a separate queue for each processor. So these processes here are part of the ready queue of CPU number one and the other one, the other set is part of CPU number zero. So Having the, that information, now let's try to look at the scheduling stats of this process. So we said last time that we can use proc the proc file system to obtain scheduling information for this process so what can we see in the scheduling characteristic properties of this process so this is the name of the process cpu this is the process id and it has one thread only so remember that this is the code that the code that is running okay and it has only one thread and this is the v runtime and other properties so the next thing that we might be interested in is how do we determine the number of threads for this process we can already uh, use this command or we can use ps minus o uh, thread count number of lightweight process and then PID of CPU so it has 
one thread count and one uh, lightweight process. Lightweight process is basically just the number of threads. Or alter alternatively, we can use ps minus l minus p then the id of cpu which will give us information about the process id and this is the lightweight process id or the thread id so that's great now, the next information that we might be interested to look at will be to know which core is this process running. If you look at the SCAD debug and we look for CPU, okay, we see here. Uh, 3037 so let's do that okay, so this is the process so you can see here that CPU on CPU 0 the current process that is running is our hello process. So currently, if you look at each stop, so you will see here that CPU 1 or CPU 0 this is the first core is 100% whereas the second core is 22 or fluctuating in this value. So to be able to know which uh, core a process is running TID is the thread ID and then CPU, we can use the PSR field, and then so you will notice that it is running on processor one. So let's see what's happening here. So currently, uh, process uh, this process CPU is running on processor one which is actually this one is 100% full okay, so notice the percent CPU here if we terminate the process let's see what will happen to the system so currently CPU is running on core one so if we stop this process let's see what will happen So you will notice that this core is no longer filled. But if you want to, if you run the code again, so you will notice that CPU is now running on uh, 
the process CPU is now running on core zero. That's why we have a 100% consumption here. Let's stop this again. So we've now seen how to view the properties of the processes. Now, the CPU example is or has only one thread. Now, if we take a look at an example with multiple threads, okay. so this is what we're going to do. And I modified this to put the thread to sleep for 200 millisecond microseconds. Okay. So let's try this okay. and then if we put three threads 10, 20, 100, 200. Okay. Uh, let's say 10,000 to take, make it take more time. Okay. So using the previous commands, let's take a look at the scheduler snap a snapshot of the scheduler properties of this process so as you can see this is the name of the process threads this is the process id 5704 and there are three threads and you can see the other properties here but but the important thing to know is that this process threads actually has three threads so the next thing that we might be interested in is knowing the thread count using the ps command Oh, no, not CPU. Uh, what are the threads? Did the process complete already? Yes, the process completed already. Okay. So here we have thread count three and the number of lightweight process three. Okay still the same and then let's take a look at the scheduler debug and let's look for threads so we have one threads here, state is running, the process ID is 6250 for the thread ID. Then we have another thread here, uh, 6249 so where what cpu is this running is this uh, are these threads running so I think it is CPU one, okay. So we can do this through this uh, file, or we can use the this command line here. To view where the different threads are being scheduled. So as you can see here, 
this is the this is the parent process ID okay, which is the main uh, function basically then this another thread and this is another thread and you will notice that the processor where these threads are executing are changing this means that at some point the process will be moved from one processor to another as you can see here can actually i think we can actually do this in h stock so we have the three processes here and uh, you can see their CPU share right? and their niceness right? uh, we can modify this to say F4 Anyway, it's better to use the command line. But you see the idea here that this threads process, each thread in this process moves from uh, one process, one processor to another. This is the column. Okay. Now, what if we want to pin the one process to uh, to pin all the threads to one processor only? We can do that use, using the task set command. So let's stop this process. Then we can use the task set minus C. Let's say we want to pin the process to run only on CPU 0. Then And then when we watch it, you will notice that the threads in this process do not migrate to the other core. They remain in core zero. If you want to pin this process to core one, we can do so using task set and then we now we are now able to pin the processes to for one okay, so this is where they are executing okay so with that we conclude uh, our discussion on scheduling and this is a demonstration of how scheduling is done in Linux using the which uses the completely fair scheduler and supports multiprocessor scheduling again as a reminder uh, please try these commands in your own systems because that is the best way for you to master the concepts and uh, the things that we are discussing in this class.